Ida for not stopping my mill from wearing white? I'm so confused, please help. I'm getting married soon, and we're having a traditional wedding, I'm Indian, my fiancé isn't but he was fine with having an Indian wedding. My mill to be asked me if she could wear white to our wedding, I said sure and now my fiancé is really mad at me. He says she is going to try to steal the spotlight, and she'll definitely show up wearing a long white dress and it was very irresponsible of me to just agree like that. The thing is one, I'm not going to be wearing a white bridal dress, I'll be wearing a traditional red dress that due to the design, lahenga, type of silk and embroidery is very distinctive so even if my mill does wear a white wedding dress it's not like it'll be the same? Question mark also, this may be dumb but I don't really get what the big deal is if my mill wears white even if I was also going to? As long as the groom doesn't get confused and marry the wrong person, how does it matter? Sorry if this is dumb but my fiancé is really upset that I didn't stop my mill, and I just need some help understanding, I didn't mean to upset him. Edit my fiancé knows what my wedding dress looks like, he has seen it. Edit too for those asking if Mill knows how my wedding dress looks, I'm not sure. We have discussed what the wedding will be like, she hasn't been to an Indian wedding before, but I don't think we explicitly discussed what I will be wearing, I feel like she was confused when I said she is free to wear white but that might be me projecting because the whole conversation was a bit confusing for me. Update. So as you all suggested, I talked to my fiancé about why he was concerned. He explained that his mother had previously joked that she would wear white and he had told her point blank that she wasn't allowed to do this. He didn't tell me about this because he didn't want to stress me out, apparently she has a tendency to steal attention throughout his childhood which left some trauma. So basically when I told Mill she could wear white, he was very upset that I had given permission when he had categorically refused, but he admitted it was wrong of him to get that upset when he hadn't shared any of the background information with me. We agreed that going forward we would be better about communicating, and made up. But then he wanted me to call up Mill and tell her she couldn't wear white or else she was banned from the wedding. Which, I didn't really want to do because that sounded like a surefire recipe for open hostility, and like I said earlier I don't actually have a problem with Mill wearing white. I told him that he was welcome to tell her if he wanted, but he was insisting I have to tell her because I was the one who gave permission. It was starting to turn into an argument so I showed him this post and all of your great advice. This really helped D, it helped him realize that even if Mill wore white it wouldn't really stand out, at least not in a positive way and he loved your guy's idea of just not telling Mill that I wasn't going to be wearing white. So we'll probably offer to buy her a sari. But if she insists on wearing a white dress, we just won't stop her. Thank you to everyone who gave advice. I'll try to update after the wedding. Post from op fiancé. Given the way things turned out, it seemed fitting that I post this. I'm the previous poster's then fiancé. After Pia, not her real name, posted, a lot of commenters said I was wrong for not dealing with my mother myself, and I was especially wrong for getting mad at Pia without telling her anything. I didn't want to admit it, but the more comments I read, the harder it was to brush it off. I don't have a good relationship with my mother. She was the type to demand gifts on my birthday because I wouldn't be here without her. For 18 years, I never got to open presents myself. Looking back, every event, from my games to graduation was always about her. I always felt like my life and achievements were just an extension of her accomplishments. I think I suppressed my resentment because everyone around me always acted like this was normal. I didn't know how to cope with this so I just tried to get as far away from her as possible. I applied to furthest university I could realistically get in, and stayed far away because any time I had to go back home, it was the same story. At university I was lucky enough to meet Pia, and for the first time I started to like who I was. I didn't feel like I had to hide or play down my accomplishments, or even my failures. And her family was so warm and welcoming, it felt like my childhood was just a nightmare of the past. I thought the best way to move past it was to just move ahead. I thought I would be able to handle it now as an independent adult. After all, Everyone says you're supposed to let sleeping dogs lie. And in my worst moments, I felt jealous of my wonderful fiancé for having such a welcoming loving family, even though they were treating me like one of their own. I was ashamed of my mother's behavior, and the ugliness of my resentment so I pretended everything was fine, and invited my parents to my wedding. Until this post blew up, I don't think I really understood how important my wedding was to me. I mean obviously, the whole getting married to the girl of my dreams is huge, but I mean the actual details of the whole ceremony. I actually had a really clear vision of what I wanted in the wedding, but a combination of my childhood trauma and the notion that wedding is the bride's day and not something men are supposed to care about made me unable to express it. I also didn't understand how badly I wanted an event that would be about me and not my mother. This unholy cocktail of repressed and suppressed feelings led to me unfairly lashing out at Pia when my mother tried her old tricks. At that moment I forgot white wasn't the bridal color in Indian weddings, I just felt a cold sweat that another precious moment would be hijacked by my mother. I think Pia was shocked by my outburst because she had never seen me like this, and made that post just to get some perspective. Neither of us imagined the ramifications it would have. I read every comment at least 10 times. I couldn't stop thinking about it. Unwanted memories kept invading my head, no matter how much I tried to bury my head in work or exhaust myself by exercising. I ended up having an actual meltdown that night. I was sobbing and crying, it was probably my ugliest moment. The next morning I half expected to wake up alone, and get a text that the wedding was off. Instead, incredibly, Pia stayed with me. She convinced me to go to therapy, 
encouraged me through those first few hellish sessions and gave me space when I needed it. Therapy really helped I was able to understand why I was feeling angry and upset, and how to deal with it beyond just trying to ignore it. I apologized to Pia earlier, but it let me actually be honest with her about my family. It really transformed our relationship I took over the wedding preparation, with the help of my in-laws. This turned out to be great for all of us, I got to actually design my dream wedding, my mill later told me she was really relieved that we switched because my lovely Pia didn't really care any which way about the colors or flowers and had virtually no input on any of it as long as we were getting married. You might have realized from her post that she is a pretty nonchalant and easygoing person. She used to joke that she was fine with just exchanging garlands and calling it a day. My mill was also very encouraging and patient in letting me voice my input, and even found things I didn't have but loved, like riding a horse to the ceremony. We have a running joke that I seem more like her son than Pia because our taste is so similar. And the actual wedding went really, really beautifully. Pia was ready to rescind my parents' invitations completely after everything, but her terrifying little sister suggested we invite anyway as a final sort of fuck you, to show them I wasn't alone anymore and no matter what they tried this time things would go my way. I have to admit that did appeal to me, so we decided to invite them for the third day of the ceremony, and it worked even better than I imagined. First, it helped that my mother had no real idea what an Indian wedding is like, so when she showed up in a long white tool ball gown, security actually thought she had the wrong address and didn't let her in. This was actually something I didn't plan, but the schadenfreude of seeing my mother fuming by the gate while other guests were let in was delicious. Secondly, compared the embroidered silks and sleek satins of Indian clothes, my mother's ball gown honestly looked frumpy. Instead of stealing the show, she just looked like she didn't belong. This was accented by the jewelry, the matching churi kungan and earring and bindis worn compared to her much more sparse look. Pia looked especially beautiful in her red langa choli, with intricate henna covering her hands and feet. I'm probably biased since she's my wife, but she has the most beautiful inky hair and it looks stunning adorned with gadra and gold billow on her braid. Indian brides also wear something called a mata patti which looks like a crown, it definitely made her look like a princess. I actually forgot about my parents, and my insecurity, and pretty much the rest of the universe because I couldn't stop staring at her. Then my mother tried really hard to interrupt the ceremony. First she tried coughing, but luckily Pia's aunt sitting next to her gave her a cough drop. Then she tried to initiate a conversation, but Pia's five-year-old niece loudly said in that high-pitched voice of children that really projects don't you know it's rude to talk during weddings? I'm five and I know that. I later learned that she had been coached to respond this way by my wonderful, terrifying Sil. The third time she tried to interrupt Pia's cousin, who had also been coached by Sil, jumped and loudly whispered that the food didn't seem to agree with my mother and needed to go to the bathroom immediately, I'm sure you can guess the implication, and basically pushed her away. After that she stayed embarrassedly quiet for the rest of the ceremony. Throughout all this, the Panditji never missed a beat and everyone else acted like she wasn't there. In the after-party, the difference between my mother and everyone else was unpleasantly accented by her ignorance of bollywood slash Tollywood dance skills, so she tried to refocus attention through conversation. She turned to my mother-in-law and started to complain about how hard it was to raise me. My mill, bless her heart, said however difficult children are, they bring ten times as much happiness just by growing. Your son is such a wonderful young man, you must be so proud of him. My mother didn't like the direction of the conversation, so she turned to Pia and asked her if she was sure she wanted to be with me. This was after we had gotten married. Pia looked at her like she was a bit slow and said why would I be marrying him if I wasn't sure? My mother loudly asked her again if she was really sure, because I used to wet the bed. I haven't done that since I was eight, but there she was, loudly announcing it for all and sundry. At that moment, I really, really hated her. It felt like there was something stuck in my throat, but no words came out. But Pia didn't have that problem. You must be confused, she said, and it was so confident with a touch of concern that my mother looked like she was actually confused. Then she raised her voice so it could be heard over the music. Dear, my mother, I know we are family now, but it's much too soon right now, or ever, for me to hear about your bedroom activities. Then she dragged me away to the dance floor while people started to stare at my mother. Stupidly, the first thing I said in our first dance as a married couple was that my mother was right. But because I am the luckiest man alive, Pia just squeezed my hand and told me it happens when children are put under stress and it wasn't my fault. That was pretty much the end of the problem, and I enjoyed the rest of my wedding dancing, eating food and talking with Pia, and now my, wonderful family. I did see Pia and my Sil having another talk with my mother later, but I was too far away to hear anything. It couldn't have been too bad because my Sil smiled a lot, and my mother didn't try anything new for the rest of the party. By the end of the day, my mother looked incredibly constipated, but she hadn't managed to ruin anything. I felt so relieved when I said goodbye, like a weight had just slipped off my feet and my knees felt weak. It was the first time in my life that she hadn't taken over something that was supposed to be about me. After that day I haven't had any more sudden invasive memories of the past. I feel so incredibly lucky to have married this girl, and I feel like I might have done something really stupid after that fight, if I hadn't seen so many strangers telling me the same thing until I couldn't ignore it, so in case anyone was still following this, I wanted to post a thank you. Parents opened up several credit cards in my name while I was away at college. I guess this is a lesson in paying attention to my finances.
After having just finished my freshman year of college, I came back to my parents' house for the summer. My mom made it a habit on Monday slash Tuesday to make sure she got the mail before I had a chance, even running from the kitchen Tuesday to make sure I didn't get it as I was expecting an Amazon order. Today, the mail came kind of early and there was a letter from a collection agency addressed to me. I only knew it was a collection agency once I opened it and discovered I supposedly owed nearly $5,000 on a Capital One card I had no idea I was ever signed up for. Once I got done freaking out, I called my dad at work and asked him what to do. It was weird when he said to talk to my mother about it. He didn't seem happy at all but I didn't think much of it. Once my mom got home, I asked her about it and she said her and my dad opened up a few credit cards in my name for household expenses. She said she thinks I owe around $10,000 to three different credit card companies. I checked my credit and it turns out I owe over $15,000. We ended up having a huge argument about it with my mom saying her parents did this to her when she was 18. She said that I could file for bankruptcy and that it wouldn't hurt me because I wouldn't be trying to buy a house for several years. I'm interested in going into a government-related job and a bankruptcy would probably disqualify me for it. She knows this but it doesn't seem like she cares. My dad got home a couple of hours ago and they talked to me together. Either I can declare bankruptcy once they spend up to the credit limit of the last card with any credit on it, or they said I could move out at the end of the month. It just feels like it's incredibly unfair because it doesn't sound like bankruptcy will actually do anything for my credit and probably sink my job opportunities. How can I get my credit score back to where it was, which was around 720, and how can I get this to not affect my credit going forward? Update I ended up taking the advice of the vast majority of people here and I filed a police report. The officer took some printouts of everything as evidence. Once I had the report, I called all of the places listed on my report and gave them the report number. The three credit card companies all took it and were pretty cool with it. The collection agency wanted me to make a goodwill payment so they could start investigating my claim that it was fraudulent. They said they could still sue me even with a police report if I didn't cooperate with their fraud report. I refused obviously as I don't want them to be able to take money out of my bank account. I never told my parents that I went to the police and for a couple of weeks, they had no idea. Right after Memorial Day they received a call from a detective and everything blew up. After the call, they began screaming at me and my dad started literally throwing my things out of the door. I called the police at that time and they showed up and told my parents if they wanted me to leave, they would have to evict me. I came home from work the next day and the locks were changed. I called the police again and my parents refused to open the door and said all of my stuff was at my grandparents' house. I received another report number for the unlawful eviction, which I was told was a civil issue, and got my stuff from my grandparents. Luckily, I have a friend with a couple of spare bedrooms and she said I'm welcome to stay with her for a couple of months. I'm scheduled to move into my own place in about a week. Once I get a full tally of the total cost of everything included in moving, I'll be filing a civil lawsuit against my parents for the unlawful eviction. I was told by the same detective my parents didn't seem very truthful with anything and the state's attorney's office will be in contact in the next few weeks regarding identity theft charges. He said he believes they will likely prosecute, possibly as soon as this week. If that's the case, they, or more likely just my mom, will be issued a warrant and have to spend at least a night in jail. No matter what, I feel as though I made the right choice. Ida for not letting my kids ride 4 hours home with their grandmother. Around 1 a.m. there was a terrible crash as my, 70F, Mill decided to try to navigate our stairs in the dark while wearing a CPAP. She tumbled down the steps, hitting her head bad enough to bruise her face and cause some serious swelling around her ear. I immediately started calling 911 but my wife who is a NICU RN told me not to call as her mother had no obviously broken bones and didn't want to go. I'm not a medical professional and it's seldom wise to argue with a nurse or one's wife but I pressed for them to at least let me drive her to the ER if they refused an ambulance but all to no avail. This was just a couple of hours ago and she's now in the bed with an ice pack and a couple of Tylenol, to avoid blood thinners. In the morning she wants to drive home and take my, 9F, daughter and, 13 meters, son to her place for the week. This has been planned for weeks and I would have no issues with it but for the fact that the woman just fell down a flight of stairs and could have a concussion. I love her and don't want her to drive at all and asked her to stay a couple of extra days but if she insists on going I can't stop her. I told my wife I was uncomfortable with the kids riding with her given the danger and she thinks I'm being silly which I don't understand at all as she's a very competent nurse. I finally told her that everyone could be mad at me but it simply wasn't an option. I'll take the day off and drive them if I must but I won't take any chances. Ida? Update 18 hours later. Well, my mill was alive and conscious when we woke this morning. My wife stayed up to watch over her through the night. I spoke to my wife this morning and again shared my concerns regarding the dangers my mill would be posing to herself and our kids and my wife was frustrated that I questioned her opinion but when I asked if she was so utterly certain in her diagnosis sans any medical equipment that she was willing to bet both her mother and our children's lives on it, she sheepishly relented and agreed the kids would stay home and that she would encourage her mom to go to the ER. I spoke to my mill again and asked her to let me take her to the ER, and she shared that her primary reason for refusing medical care was a fear of the cost of doing so. Unfortunately, that's a serious concern of many folks here in the US. Anyways, hearing that, I firmly insisted she go and told her we'd cover any costs. She and my wife finally went to the ER and after several hours and copious tests, 
It was in fact determined that she had a concussion as well as rib and wrist fractures and soft tissue injuries, bruising. My wife was pretty devastated with the diagnosis and was deeply apologetic and remorseful. My mother-in-law will be in the hospital until at least tomorrow. The hospitalist pretty directly chided both my wife and Mill. All in all, I'm thankful that things didn't end up worse. The kids only cared about their grandma being okay. Some answers to questions asked. My Mill is a retired school teacher on a very limited fixed income along with my Phil. There's no inheritance or other reason my wife would have wished her ill. They have a great relationship. My wife sprang out of bed the moment the accident happened and was almost detached and clinical at the moment but was later extremely emotional. Her father had a major stroke last year, and we actually just sold our house Friday in order to move closer to her parents to help take care of them in their old age. While my wife has been a NICU nurse for a decade, she was a step-down ICU nurse for eight years. I realize that doesn't strengthen her case regarding her decision, but perhaps it adds context. She really is remarkable with babies and has saved many a life, but I can certainly understand why the circumstances of these events would paint her in a less than beneficial light. In retrospect, I think my wife was in a state of shock. She's never lost anyone, and her dad's stroke is still fresh on her mind. I've lost both parents and four siblings plus plenty of friends my time in the service, so I have to look at her through a lens of empathy. I, 24F, told the man I have been taking to, 30M, that I am nervous to meet him because I'm overweight. I, 24F, have been talking with a man well call him Tom 30M for about a month. We have not met yet in person and are supposed to finally meet in the beginning of June. An hour ago, I sent him a message telling him that I am nervous to meet him because I am a bit overweight. For context, about one, five years ago I ended things with my ex-fiancé. The breakup was very messy and mentally taxing. I entered a depressive state. I stopped working out, gained about 60 pounds, I was vaping and dependent on alcohol much more than I should have. I also didn't feel like myself at all and was very unhappy. Luckily, I have an amazing family, friends and a pretty dope therapist. Slowly, I've been able to pull myself out of my depression rut and by the start of this year I was feeling much like my old self again. Feeling better, I decided to really grind down on breaking these bad habits. I quit vaping three months ago and about one month ago I started going to the gym consistently. My relationship with alcohol is much healthier as well. Now I'm trying to clean up my diet to lose weight so I can feel confident in my skin again. I really had no intentions of dating seriously until I met my goals but here we are. At the begging of this month I was bored and swiping on Hinge and I happened to match with Tom. He asked to follow me on Instagram and I didn't think much would happen. The first few days we chatted it was sparse and nothing of interest. Plus he told me he would be out of town in another country until June. Then everything shifted, we had one really good conversation and I found myself looking forward to each notification I received from him. He's sweet, kind and really funny. He remembers small details such as my favorite flowers. Today he even sent me a photo of a plate with my favorite flower and said it reminded him of me. He's also told me he already likes me on numerous occasions. We send photos of each other back and forth. He has seen what I look like, but I don't think he realizes I'm a bit chubby. Mainly in the arm and stomach area. We are supposed to meet when he comes back and I started to get nervous that he would no longer be attracted to me. Which is something that has never bothered me before, I have still been casual with men throughout this. I also know that I am pretty and so much more than looks but, I have genuine feelings for this man and I am afraid of his rejection. I sent him a message a few hours ago with many of the same details I included here. I'm really nervous for his response and it's getting close to morning in the country he's currently at. I want to hear advice from those who may have been in a similar situation. Update. Hi guys, I do have an update for everyone. I wanted to start by thanking everyone for the very kind comments and encouraging messages. I really appreciate everyone who took the time to read this post and give thoughtful advice. I also wanted to address all of the photos on my Hinge profile and Instagram are from the past 8 months. None of my old photos from when I was thinner are present on either platform. However, I do feel these photos are more flattering angels of myself. Now on to the update. An hour after my Antichula post he did see and reply to my message. I got super nervous and took some time to calm my nerves before opening and replying. To my absolute delight it was very thoughtful and kind message. Up. You were considering waiting and making excuses not to meet? You're beyond fine. I appreciate the vulnerability, but you didn't need to say all of this. However, since you did I'll say this back. Wherever you're at is fine. You're beautiful, and there's no need to worry. I'm not worried one way or another. Lifestyle, chemistry, and compatibility are what's important to me when looking at who I'm interested in seeing not if there's some arbitrary societal standard of weight or beauty. If there's anything I can do to ease that worry, let me know. We ended up talking until about 4 in the morning and I'm happy to say that we will be meeting when he is back in the beginning of June. Thank you so much again. I will maybe give another update in the future here soon. Update. I know everyone has been waiting for the update and I'm happy to say today we finally went on our date. Thank you again for all of the encouraging comments and support. But, before I jump into that there were a few more comments and questions I wanted to address, especially because this post made its way to other subreddits. First thing is that both Tom and I are from the US and live in the same state. He was out of the country for work. He is not foreign. Second, many people assumed that I was sleeping with other men while talking to him. I was not, in fact he was the only person I was talking to. 
Now onto the date itself. It was absolutely wonderful and he is genuinely one of the kindest, funniest and most handsome man I have ever had the pleasure of going on a date with. Tom was very excited to see me, we hugged and he surprised me with sunflowers. We got cozy on the couch and ended up talking for nearly 4 hours. We got kicked out because the spot we went to closed. He was really easy to talk to and the conversations moved just as smoothly as they did through texts. Also, I kept blushing because he kept complimenting me and the way he was looking at me I know he is attracted to me. After we got kicked out, we chatted outside for a bit longer and he walked me to my car. We hugged and I went to kiss him on the cheek and he turned my face and kissed me on the lips instead. It was very cute and sweet. Tom asked me if I wanted to see him again this weekend and I said yes. He also messaged me immediately when he got home of when and where we will be going. Ida for refusing to cook dinner for my BF since he won't respect my cooking utensils? I, 21F, live with my BF, 28M, and I recently purchased some new wooden spoons, like the big kind, from a co-worker who is an aggressive pampered chef consultant. I don't make very much money and frankly these spoons were overpriced but I wanted her to leave me alone and after all they're nice spoons and I will definitely use them. They are hand wash only, which I informed my BF of when I brought them home. It's been a couple months and I find them in the dishwasher pretty regularly. Every time I have nicely reminded him that they are hand wash only and please don't put them in the dishwasher. I have said, you don't need to wash them, leave them out and I will wash them. Every time he says okay but then, you know where this is going. I often come home on my lunch break to keep up with housework. A few days ago I came home and found one of my wooden spoons in the dishwasher. I texted my BF about it, this time with some emphasis on the fact that I've repeatedly asked him not to put this item in the dishwasher and it will literally end up destroying the spoon and I really don't want that to happen to a new utensil I just bought. He replied I don't care. I was completely taken aback. I expected him to say okay sorry and probably keep doing it, not be completely rude to me. Background, I have always cooked dinner since we moved in together two years ago. I was in school and it felt like part of how I contributed to the household since I wasn't making very much money only working part time. But I'm out of school now and working more and contributing more to the bill so I don't feel the same obligation to cook. He usually cleans up after dinner by putting things in the dishwasher, but doesn't clean anything else. When he got home after work that night, he asked what we were having for dinner. I told him I'd already eaten. He was extremely upset that I hadn't cooked for him or otherwise arranged dinner. He stomped around the house and eventually got takeout. The next day he asked me what we were having for dinner. I told him I wasn't planning on making anything. He asked why I wasn't cooking anymore and I said if he didn't care about whether or not my wooden spoons got destroyed then I didn't care about cooking dinner. He totally lost it, said I was completely overreacting, it was no reason to stop cooking dinner without warning. Told me I'm being immature and that he's too busy to keep track of what can or can't go in the dishwasher and it's unfair that I'd punish him for it. It's not his fault he doesn't care about wooden spoons, and insinuated our relationship might be in trouble if this is how I react to conflict. I do feel like maybe this wasn't the most mature route and I am a lot younger than him so I'm worried he's right that I'm being unreasonable and immature. But like, how hard is it to leave my wooden spoons out for me to wash after being told multiple times that they can't go in the dishwasher? Edit so this totally blew up and I'm pretty overwhelmed by the response. It's clear to me that most of you are right that the incident is a red flag and highly telling about the dynamics of our relationship overall. I have always thought that I'm happy in this relationship and that it's really good, but now I'm really confused and have a lot to think about. To answer common questions. We met when I was 17 and he was 24. He does do some chores. Well, he takes out the garbage sometimes, mows the lawn sometimes, though I confess that I also do that one on my lunch break occasionally, and handles all the car maintenance. But he's never done any real cleaning in the house. The house is his, he bought it when I was 19 and I do currently pay for half the mortgage slash bills slash groceries. It leaves me essentially no money for myself. Our finances are pretty mixed and he monitors my credit card usage obsessively, to the point that he will sometimes call me 15 minutes after a purchase to ask for details about it, why did you spend $54? 28 at Costco? Dot, which I see now is also pretty controlling and unhealthy. I am seriously reconsidering the relationship but also don't really know how I'd leave. I've never lived on my own, I don't want to move back in with my parents BC that's a whole other story. I don't know the first thing about getting an apartment on my own, but I don't want this dynamic to be the rest of my life. Thanks for the eye-opening revelation but FCK. Where do I go from here? Second edit forgot to mention he makes about twice as much money as I do. Third edit holy crap you guys. You are all being so amazing to me it's really overwhelming and emotional. I'm hardly responding to comments slash messages BC I'm grappling with a lot of hard truths about all this right now. I am so appreciative for everyone who has taken the time to point out the red flags and offer encouragement and support. This community is freaking amazing and I'm just blown away. I'm also figuring out an exit strategy. I actually already have a small cash stash where I've been saving up money to take the licensing exam for the profession my degree is aimed at. I realize now how sad it is that I've had to sneak cash into an envelope for an exam to advance my career. And how the only reason my BF has been adamant we couldn't afford this is BC it would offer me better job opportunities with better pay and more chance for freedom. I'm literally re-examining every last detail of my relationship right now and uncovering more and more unsettling details. The rose-colored glasses are off.
Those of you who guessed I've been pretty isolated from friends are correct, my social life is his social life and I don't know how that even happened. Not wanting to go to my parents for help is more of a pride thing with a bit of estrangement. It wouldn't be ideal but I'm understanding now that my situation is grave enough to consider putting my pride aside and ask them for help. I was, and I guess still am, feeling terrified about trying to live on my own since my BF has been taking care of me my entire adult life but as someone commented, I've been taking care of him, managing a house, and paying half a mortgage and bills. I can actually take care of my shit, I do not need him. That said I'm emotionally gutted and I'm not ready to go nuclear on this situation just yet, but I will post an update once I'm out to let everyone know how it goes. While I'm coming around to admitting I'm in an emotionally abusive situation, I'm having a hard time imagining him getting violent with me. However I hear your concerns and have read a lot of the resources you guys have provided and plan to act as though violence is a possibility, even though I feel silly and dramatic for it. Better to be dramatic than hurt. Again, thank you all so much. Update. Hey y'all. Been one hell of a week for me. The feedback on my last post was really overwhelming, but I came away from it with two things I'm not the asshole, and also my relationship is a mountain of red flags for abuse. Cool cool. So I did a luwood of reflecting and realized, yay okay this looks bad but I love him? I was confused af. I met up with one of my oldest childhood friends who I hadn't seen in a couple of years and cried my heart out on her couch and she was nothing but kind and supportive and that was the beginning of a crack of light making its way into my life. I've got people, something beyond my relationship. What really sealed my decision to leave was the way my BF reacted about me hanging out alone with a friend. He didn't want me to go, and when I was firm it was happening, then he wanted to come with, and when I declined that, he threw a tantrum and was extremely passive-aggressive when I got home. That's when I realized, yay okay fuck this guy for real he doesn't want me to have friends, I'm not living like this anymore. I decided to try and save up money on the side like many of you suggested, and once I had enough, to leave without warning. However, once I decided I wanted out it was really hard to play the good GF and act like everything was normal. I think he sensed something was up and one morning while we were chatting over a perfectly nice breakfast together, he without warning grabbed me by my throat and threatened to kill me if I ever left him. Then he let me go, grinned, and said, I'm just joking around. I tried to laugh it off but it freaked me the fuck out. I decided I couldn't wait until I saved up money, so I swallowed my pride and reached out to my parents. We had a tepid dinner together where I explained in brief terms that I didn't feel safe and needed to leave my BF ASAP. My mom didn't hesitate to offer me my old room back, even though it's been her office for years now. She converted it back to my bedroom that night and the next day while my BF was at work my parents helped me move out. I left him a note and he's been going crazy trying to reach me but, I'm so done. So y'all weren't just right, you were really right. I didn't realize how unsafe I really was until he threatened to kill me. You guys had my fucking back I can't get over how amazing it is that a silly reddit post has completely changed the trajectory of my life. I read every comment, every resource, every message. I've learned so much, and I can't, thank you guys enough. To all the people who reached out offering money, that was unbelievable too, and I'm just so touched by the kindness displayed towards me. I'm so appreciative of the offers but as of now it looks like I'm gonna be able to swing this with some help from my parents. I also hope some girls out there who saw my original post maybe learned something valuable too. Life is too short to waste any of it on being a bangmaid. Wibta if I refuse to have intimacy with my husband, I won't sugarcoat any words here or make the situation in my favor. I need a very non-biased opinion. Around mid-August of 2019, me, 28F, and my husband, 35M, tied a knot between us. He have two kids from his previous marriage. He and his ex-wife are co-parenting their kids. I really love the kids. One of the major factors why I got married with him was kids. I have reasons for that. My father died when I was 15. My mom wasn't so highly educated, so with that less education qualification, she couldn't provide for me and my other three younger brothers all alone. So I started to do part-time jobs. I babysat, cleaned people's yard, took out pets for walk, did assignments of my classmates etc. I earned really little amount of money with that, but it helped my family slightest. When I was 17, I took a food delivery job. One night, around 10 to 11 I was dropping food at the other side of city. A drunk driver hit my cycle and I went into a terrible accident. The driver needed to pay a large fine for that since my condition was very critical. I had a lot internal bleeding and damage. So because of that accident, my doctor confirmed that in future the chances of me getting pregnant is very less, it will be a miracle for me to have my own kid. I was at the lowest part of my life because of that accident. I couldn't go out or do my work on my own. My family took care of me. It took me around 8 months to get well. At first I didn't mind having a childless life but when I started to notice my friends are having family. I realized the beauty of motherhood. So I started dating guys with kids. My husband was my second BF. We tied not after we dated for 10 months. When I got married his son was 11 and his daughter was 7. I got along with him well. It took them few months before they started to call me mama by their own. I left my job to be the stay-at-home mom for them. Honestly I really adore them. I have a good relationship with their bio mom too. After COVID, we went to Belgium for our second anniversary on 2021. The trip was all good and I remember feeling so loved. The day before we were supposed to come back in our home, 
He proposed the idea of opening our marriage. If I say I was hurt it'll be an understatement. I couldn't look in his eyes without feeling hollow and sorrow. I said no multiple times after coming back from the trip but he kept persisting. After a couple of weeks I gave up and agreed. He set the terms. I don't remember most of it but few of his terms was never share this information with others. We can't date our exes or friends, no emotional attachment with our partners and always use protection. In his words, he still loves me. He only opened the marriage because he wanted to gain experience and use it on our marriage. I remember going to sleep all crying and hurt. I gave up on my job to take care of him and the kids yet he yearned for another woman. We became distant. He noticed that and tried to initiate intimacy with me but I don't feel anything at all. I just lay there until he is done. I also distanced myself from him. The idea of him having intimacy with other women while being in a marriage with me disgusted me. I couldn't look at him at the same way I used to. We always have our location on so I could see where he is going. Those used to hurt me a lot until I became completely numb at this point. Now I don't see him as my husband but someone I tied knots with to be a mother. Last year, I told him I want to start work again. He got defensive kinda? He tried to use a lot reasons to show why can't I work. When he saw all of his tricks going downhill he pulled the kids in the mess. He knew I have soft spots for his kids. I didn't back down that time. He gave me cold shoulder and went on trip with one of his GF. I applied to be a teacher at my brother's high school. He is the youngest of my all siblings and a sophomore. I am teaching chemistry in his school. My husband was mad at me for having a job for few months but he gave up. I started to give myself a lot times. Since the kids have extracurriculum activities they always don't stay at home. I have a friend circle from high school. I hung out with him every two weeks. I met a guy in my workplace. He is 29 and have three kids with his late wife. One day I ranted about my whole situation. He showed interest in me after that. He is a nice guy. I went on few dates with him. Nothing physical happened between us. I think I am relying on him for mental support since he is very supportive of me. I haven't felt something like that for a long time in my life. Now few days ago, I went to salon and cut my hair short into shoulder length. My husband complimented me multiple times that day. The kids went to their grandparents' house for summer vacation. During night, he tried to initiate intimacy. While I straight up said no for the first time. I think he got taken aback? He had mix a few expressions that I can't put a finger on. He started to use the husband card on me and I put my foot down to say no. We had a huge argument and he left. I saw his location, he went to one of his girlfriend's place. He didn't contact me for two days now. Now I am stuck between two thoughts. Even if I don't feel anything towards him he is still my husband. I can't share this with anyone so I need advice on this. Update number one, next day. Last night I made a post about my current situation of my marriage and asked for a non-biased view. There are almost 300 people who responded and gave me advice. I couldn't respond all of that since I was overwhelmed with a lot of emotions. There is few things I want to clarify. Firstly, I met my husband after my graduation when I was looking for a job. I made things official with him after I had the job. We dated for 10 months before getting married. Secondly, his ex-wife and he were childhood sweetheart who married each other when they were in college. After the birth of their second child, they realized they don't have the same bond so they got divorced in a 50-50 custody. Thirdly, few people in my previous post asked me to make things official with my coworker. I would do that when I am ready. Currently my mental health isn't in the best position. I am working on it. Plus I can't have intimacy with anyone whom I barely know. We've been co-workers about almost a year but still I am not ready to make things all good. Lastly, those who are saying I am using sex as a punishment, it's quite opposite. He barely comes home. He is always out with the kids or his girlfriends. I would love to add he doesn't have one but three girlfriend and yes all of them are aware of my existence. Now to the update. Last night I made a post about the current situation of my marriage with my husband. Asking if I would be the ah if I refused to have intimacy. He haven't came back in last three days or contacted me. The kids talks with me daily. I had few conversation with their bio mom too, they are over her parents place. Honestly I thought he will get over it or won't bother me for a long time, but I was wrong as hell. During lunch, my mom came over to visit me. She asked if everything was okay between me and my husband. I didn't lie this time and straight up said no. We had a long conversation about my marriage and I was relieved after that. It felt so good after sharing everything with her. I am not ashamed to admit I cried like a kid in her arms while explaining everything. She stayed with me entire day. She called one of my younger brother, 26, and told him everything. If I say he was mad it'll be an understatement. He asked why the hell I suffered that much and scolded me for couple of minutes. With the help of my mom and brother I packed my stuffs. I didn't leave with any of the stuffs he got me. Most likely we will get a divorce soon. I texted a short message in his number, thanking him for being my husband and I won't be continuing the marriage anymore along with some personal stuffs between us. With the help of my friend and family currently I am finding a lawyer. I don't know how long it'll take me to finally get out of the marriage. I left the house around evening and sent the SMS around 7. After that I muted his number. I also told his ex-wife about this and needless to say she was as much shocked as everyone. Because he wasn't like that. She assured me that even after divorce she will let me see the kids. I am really grateful for that part. Divorcing him will be easy since we always had separate accounts. I have little savings. 
Before I get on my own feet properly I will be staying with my mom in our old house. I turned off my location before leaving his house but it won't be long until he figures out where am I. He is currently messaging me but I am not strong enough to open them and read them so I haven't responded or read his SMS. Update 2. Hi, it's me again. Thank you for all the support you guys gave on my previous post. I would write everything briefly as my lawyer suggested not to share anything too much. I got a lawyer the day after I left the house. He told me not worry about anything currently. The divorce proceeding started few days ago. My STBX received the paper and he went ballistics. There was several emotional episode from him. The proceedings will take times to end. At least 90 days. We had a prenuptial agreement before marriage so I won't be getting any of asset. I don't want anything from him plus my payment as a teacher is enough to fend myself. I just want him to get out my life and start everything over again. Lately he have been massaging me a lot, telling me about how he misses my cooking and stuffs. It just weirds me out a lot. So I ignore his SMS and calls. I only talk to him through lawyers. I used to feel trapped in this marriage but now, I feel free a bit. Some relatives from his sides contacted me. Mostly they are accusing me for letting him have his affairs. In their words, it's my fault that I couldn't tie my husband by side and let him open marriage. His mother sent few of the nasty SMS which I didn't expect it from her since she was a woman too. I took screenshots of those. I might sue for harassment if anything goes further than just text messages or voicemails. I was fired over false accusations of S. A. And company says I can't sue. I held a management position at a company. I asked a non-management employee of the opposite sex to step into another room to discuss her performance away from other employees. She was going through a divorce and had made a few mistakes, and while I didn't want to embarrass her, I did want to make sure the mistakes were addressed. She acknowledged it and thanked me. An hour later I was escorted from my office by security and was informed by my boss that a sexual harassment complaint had been made and proper protocol was to suspend me. I asked what it was and was told, we need to investigate. I can't disclose that. He assured me that it shouldn't take long and if I wasn't guilty of anything, I'd be paid for the time out. I again asked what the accusation was and was told that as there was an ongoing investigation I was not permitted to know, but if they had questions, I would be contacted. I wasn't happy, but knowing that I didn't do anything wrong, I left the building. Later that night, I received a notification on my phone that my email password was incorrect. After two days, I called my boss asking for an update and was told he was not available but I would hear something soon. I began calling daily and received the same response. Finally, I received a letter in the mail informing me that I was terminated for exposing myself and requesting sexual favors from an employee. The employee listed was the young lady I had pulled into the side room. I immediately called up my boss and was told, he is unavailable, and said to say the matter is closed. My buddy, the IT guy, messaged me on Facebook asking what happened as he'd been told to deactivate my accounts. When I told him the whole story, he replied, you took her into the X room. Dude, there's a security camera in there. We keep Y in there, so we always have the camera on. Sure enough, he pulls the footage and there I am, holding a pile of papers, pointing to them, and keeping my pants on the whole time. I left a message for my boss that the alleged incident occurred in a room with surveillance and that I would be contacting an attorney and subpoenaing the video record. I received a call back 15 minutes later asking me to please participate in a phone conference with him in HR. The conference went as expected. They didn't realize it had occurred in a room with surveillance, they have a zero tolerance policy that they have to enforce, you can't be too careful in this day and age, they regret that this didn't come to light sooner. They've already replaced me, and as it wouldn't be fair to terminate my replacement as she's done nothing wrong, they don't have a job to offer me back. However, as a gesture of goodwill, they're going to pay me through my suspension, change my file so it reads that I voluntarily resigned, and provide me a good reference. I replied that wasn't acceptable. They made a false accusation against me, withheld vital information that I could have easily refuted, refused to take my calls, and completely failed in their own investigation by not checking video footage that would have immediately exonerated me. They asked what I thought would be fair. I told them they could immediately terminate the employee who made the accusation and either give me my job back or pay me out one year's salary in addition to what was offered. My boss said that he could not discuss another employee with me, and that neither of those options are feasible. The only options I have are what he already offered. I replied that the options I gave are the only way I'm not going to sue the company along with the employee. My boss replied that I signed an agreement when I was first hired saying I would take all disputes through arbitration and that I waived my right to sue the company. I do not remember signing the agreement, and I have not seen it, but it apparently says that I will take all disputes to arbitration, I will bear the costs of arbitration, and that I will accept the decision in arbitration. He stated that I will not fare any better in arbitration than he's already offered and I'll be out the money to cover the arbitration. I feel like I'm being bullied here, and don't think he would have scheduled a phone conference with such immediacy if he didn't think the company was vulnerable to a lawsuit. I'm waiting on a callback from a few employment attorneys. Do I have a case? Am I wrong to feel that this is unacceptable? Update 1. Quite a bit has happened in the last few weeks. A friend of mine at another company, after hearing what happened told me his company had an opening. I applied, interviewed, and at the end the manager asked me what I like to be called. Two days later I got a call saying they'd gone with another candidate. 
My friend admitted to me that he'd gotten some flack for recommending me. Apparently HR had worked with one of the employees at my former company, and called the employee to ask what the deal was with me. To which the employee responded, he got fired for sexually assaulting a subordinate. I think he's actually being charged criminally. I'm literally crying as I type this. It's a nightmare that won't end. Long story short, I lost my shit, called up my old company, boss wouldn't get on the phone with me, had an attorney draft a letter of demand and send it off. Had another phone conference scheduled. They once again regret that an employee provided a reference outside of the prescribed channels. The employee was coached on the proper way to handle such requests. My attorney informed them that in addition to wrongful termination, we would be adding defamation to our complaint against them. They insist that they have not broken any laws and they cannot control the actions of an individual employee who went against company policy. So we're at an impasse there. Either I move ahead against them, or I walk away. At this point I'm ready to drag this through court. I tried to take the high road and go elsewhere, but they're regretting a lot that they've done to me without any action to correct it. Oh, I almost forgot. A few days after my last post, they sent me a packet of papers. Standard non-disclosure notifications, COBRA, and a blank copy of the arbitration agreement for me to sign. Why a blank one, you ask? Well it seems somebody fucked up. They weren't making people sign when I was hired, and HR never bothered to have me sign when the agreement when I worked there. I of course have signed nothing that they sent me including that agreement. I considered allowing arbitration if they pay the costs and I have approval over who is selected, but my attorney has advised not to do that. I wish I had better news to report. Things aren't as hopeless as they'd first seemed, but not as easily fixable either. As for the employee who made the accusation, I know you're eager to hear, but at this point I can't comment on what's happening there. Thanks for all of the advice and support so far. I promise to update when everything resolves, if not sooner, as much as I can. Update 2. Everything has resolved, and I've been wanting to give you guys an update, but had to wait until my lawyer gave me the okay to talk about things. So let's start from the beginning. I pulled one of my direct reports, Deborah, into another room to discuss a few mistakes she made, but did not discipline her further. After this, she went to Joyce, one of the managers above me but not in my direct line of report. Equal to my boss in terms of reporting structure. When Joyce heard that I had taken Deborah into another room without any witnesses, she said to her that it was unprofessional. Apparently her exact words were, you know, you could accuse him of being inappropriate with you, and I would have no choice but to believe you. This was repeated several times, with a strong emphasis on no choice. Joyce then asked Deborah if I had been inappropriate with her, saying, it will only happen again if you don't speak up now. If you do now, we can take action. Taking the not at all subtle hint from Joyce, Deborah accused me of exposing myself to her, and I was placed on leave pending an investigation. Joyce immediately sent out an email that nobody besides the secretary was to speak with me without an attorney present, and told the IT guy, Paul, to deactivate my access. James, my boss, had a resume from Terry, an employee in Joyce's department, applying for my job before close of business that day, and she was hired. Paul and I talked, he provided me with video proving my innocence. The company continued to stonewall me, and refused to talk to me. When they did, they attempted to push me into arbitration, and to retroactively sign an arbitration agreement. I cut my losses, took another job, and was ready to move on. Sandy, an employee in Joyce's department, broke protocol, talked to HR at the new company, told them I had sexually assaulted a subordinate, and cost me the job. So that brings us up to date. My attorney and I launched a civil suit against the company and Deborah. Bet you're wondering how I know the above. Well good old Joyce said she'd protect Deborah if she came forward. Unfortunately, that only extended to her job. So when she was named individually in this suit, corporate told her they would not be providing her an attorney. After realizing that she'd be putting her house up for collateral, she was all too willing to throw Joyce under the bus. Joyce went to Paul, the IT guy, who was one of her reports and gave him a list of footage to be procedurally wiped as part of an archive clearout. He pointed out that the incident with me was on that list and part of an ongoing investigation. Joyce told him that it was no longer needed and to go ahead and wipe it. He refused citing the fact that it would still be requested in the event that the suit moved forward. She told him to pack his things as he was being terminated for insubordination. He called the company attorney and informed her what had happened. The aftermath. Several things happened at once, so I'll try to keep them as chronological as I can. Deborah's attorney contacted mine stating that, conditional on me dropping the suit, she would admit that she lied and explain what went on behind the scenes. Dana, the company attorney, got the call from my attorney with the details from Deborah shortly after she finished talking with Paul about him being terminated for refusing to destroy evidence. Deborah and Joyce were terminated for cause that day. Paul was told that his job was safe. My attorney received a call and it was made clear that the company didn't want this to go any further and wanted to talk settlement. I won't go into all of the details, but what I can say I was offered my job back with a very fair increase, I received back pay from the date of suspension, and a public apology was offered from the very top. Terry is now working in Joyce's old position, she's incredibly cool about things, and felt horrified when she found out what happened. James and I are good now, and he has personally apologized for not sticking up for me. 
This will likely be my final update, there is still some legal battle ongoing, but I can't go into that too much. I am getting bullied at work and I don't know what to do. For context I am 19F, moved to the Netherlands last year, uni student and work in a supermarket. Yesterday I brought homemade stroopwafels to work because it was my birthday on Tuesday. I put them in the break room with a card next to it saying everyone can take one. Well three hours later I took my break and they were all still there. Note this is a huge supermarket with a lot of staff, except for one that a woman was taking but then another girl said translated you don't take those, Fomka brought them. The woman then made a disgusted face and threw it in the trash. She didn't even put it back on the plate. Stuff like that happens every shift but this hurt more because I made the cookies to celebrate my birthday and even bought a waffle iron to make them. In the end no one took any cookies so I took them home and haven't touched them since. Update. After all the support I got on my post yesterday, I had the courage to go to my workplace this morning and confront the girl directly. I told her I overheard her telling our coworker not to eat my cookies and asked her if she had a problem with me. At first she denied it but when I bluffed and told her I knew she was the one who hid my bag and had proof, I actually didn't know who did it, and I was gonna tell the manager, she admitted she didn't like me at all. When I wanted to know why, she asked me to meet her after her shift ended so she could explain. Turns out, she had seen my Instagram username from my phone and looked me up. She had read my posts about becoming Dutch. It made her really angry because even though she was born in the Netherlands and so were her parents, she wasn't considered Dutch but was still judged as a foreigner for the way she looked and because of her ancestry. Meanwhile, I walked in with pale skin, blonde hair, blue eyes and acted like I owned the place. She also said I come across as a spoiled rich girl who doesn't care about her job, to be honest, I haven't been working as hard as I could be, and that I just get everything handed to me. Everyone hated working with me because I was always slacking off and so she wanted me to quit. Finally, she admitted to pitting my coworkers against me and showing them my Instagram account. I was really surprised by her honesty. I apologized for making her feel that way. I explained that actually, I looked a lot like her when I was younger and knew how it felt. When she didn't believe me, I showed her pictures from my childhood on my phone from before I had my surgeries and so. I said I knew how she felt and I was struggling to fit in too. I told her it made me really sad how I was treated at work. We had a good talk about living in the Netherlands and having to deal with people gatekeeping the Dutch identity. I promised to work harder and make sure to do my fair share for the short time till my contract ends. Then I'm quitting my job. She agreed that was for the best because my coworkers apparently hate me an unreasonable amount and she doubts that is going to change. She said my stroopwafels look delicious and asked if I could show her how to bake them. So now she is coming over on Thursday and someone is going to eat my cookies after all. I want to end this post by saying, be kind to each other, you never know what someone has been through and people deserve the benefit of the doubt. If you are getting bullied, that is not your fault and please talk to someone you trust for help. Other OOP posts for context. I will post my coming out story I posted on my Instagram last year, I don't mention my Italian heritage in it for safety reasons, but it might make you understand where I'm coming from. I was assigned American at birth but I never fit in. I can't connect to American culture even though I tried. Barbecue, guns, cars, football, it doesn't make me happy. Never has. My former therapist misdiagnosed me with depression. When I was 14 my parents took me on a vacation to Amsterdam. I rode a bicycle, ate stroopwafel, wore clogs and went to the Van Gogh Museum. I thought I didn't like cheese, turns out I just don't like the plastic American kind. Going to the Netherlands was liberating and I never felt that way before. I did a lot of research and I started connecting the dots. I'm a Dutch person born in the wrong country. I told my best friend and she said it made sense BC I never want to pay for things lol. She really supported me and I will forever be grateful. Coming out to my parents was a different story. Lots of shitty stuff happened but long story short my mom now supports me and I have gone NC with my dad. I had leg lengthening surgery last year, I dyed my hair blonde and I will get eye color surgery sometime this year. I had to sacrifice a lot to be able to live as my true self. I don't give a shit if you believe me or not but please please keep those thoughts to yourself. I'm allowed to exist and define my identity the way I want to and I don't deserve to be mocked for it. Oop also goes on to explain their experience with biological transracialism. In my middle school class was this tan, Asian looking girl who was born in the Philippines but both her biological parents are white with blonde hair and blue eyes. Yes, both her father and her mother, I have met them plenty of times. But because her mother gave birth while living in the Philippines, she looks like Bo people from the Philippines look. Her brother and sister were born while her parents lived in Sweden and they are white with blonde hair and blue eyes. Maybe you don't believe me but this is a real thing that I saw with my own two eyes. Race is so much more than just genetics or ancestry. Just because no one is funding studies that document it doesn't mean it's not true. Genetics don't determine your race. Ada for forcing my fiancé into cutting off his late wife's family? I, 25F, am getting married to my fiancé, 29M, in May. When we first got together he told me that he was married from 20 to 22 years old to his high school sweetheart. We met when he was 25, but she passed of sepsis from a botched surgery. He didn't cope well and stayed in contact with her family, namely father and two sisters, 19 and 24. It was a soft spot for me for a while at the beginning because there was so much history they had that we would not have and it was tough knowing that she was all around him. 
I never told him and decided to work through it on my own, especially with the fact that he would often spend time with her family during our relationship. Her birthday, their anniversary and anniversary of her death, he'd spend the day with her family. It was uncomfortable at first knowing the man I loved was reminiscing about love he had with someone else but I kept trying to see it from his perspective and the last couple years I am completely secure in our relationship and it doesn't bother me much anymore. Well, he proposed this time last year and I was over the moon. I love this man with all my heart but I recently learned that he never told them that we got engaged. I've been trying local coffee shops the past few months rather than my usual run and tried a new one. His late wife's sister worked there and other than being awkward, she did a double take of my engagement ring and looked really unhappy. I didn't mention it and left. My fiancé told me that she kept messaging him on social media about it and I wasn't happy that he kept it a secret. He apologized and was very depleted by it all. He said that he didn't want to hide me but he didn't want to hurt them either and that both of us were a huge part of his life. I understand that and let him off the hook slightly, just told him to be upfront with them from now on. That was that. At least I thought so. A week ago, on Sunday, I got a message from the 24 years old asking if I was happy with myself, that I would never replace his LW and that if she was still alive he'd chose her over me every time. She even said that he only kept me around for me money and something to stick his dick in. I ignored it but I can't say that it didn't affect me. When you're in my position, all these points are ones you have to work through and it's not easy to get over those insecurities. It feels like a knock in the teeth when they're used against you. I mentioned it to him and he comforted me and reassured me. He said he'd set boundaries with her and I'd never have to hear from her again. Fine by me. That was until I found my car with horror and grave robber smeared in red paint. I had saved for this car for a year and it was expensive, very expensive. The tires were slashed and the windows cracked. I asked the store a few doors down for their CCTV camera footage of that night but it was blurry and didn't catch much. It did manage to catch half a license plate though in the color and make of a car. It was his LW's youngest sister's car. I told him I was filing a police report and he asked me to hold off until he talked to them first. I told him no but I would if they paid for the damages and apologized to my face. He set up the meeting for last night and it didn't go well to say the least. Everyone was shouting. The sisters told me they, yes both of them, had nothing to be sorry for and that I should leave their family alone, including my fiancé and their family. He told them that it wasn't fair to him to be lonely forever and that he'd hope they'd be supportive of him finding love again. They told him he was betraying LW and that he never loved her if he'd marry someone else. They didn't have a problem with him having a new GF because he'd realize she was the only one for him and get tired of me. Now that hadn't happened, they were putting their foot down. The youngest told him to tell me that they were right and that he'd never love anyone like LW. My fiancé broke down at the table. I picked him up and made us leave. I told them I'd be filing a report and suing for damages, and the next time they saw us would be in court. When we got back and calmed down I gave him an ultimatum. Either he cuts contact or we call of the wedding and go out separate ways. I wasn't going to live my life with this harassment and someday subject my children to their bullying. He said they would never bully a child but I shot him down and said he didn't expect any of this either. He called their father, who was fairly chill about it all but still defending his daughters. They say I shouldn't control him and that I'm horrible for cutting them off. I don't know what to do. I can't live like this and I don't think I should have to just because we're getting married. Hey everyone, just a mini update to clear some things up before I have a discussion with my fiancé either later today or tomorrow about my ultimatum. I didn't sleep at all yesterday or the night before, for obvious reasons. There's a ding on my phone at least once an hour from them saying one thing or another, mainly the 19 yo and I don't know what they've told people but I've got a message from one of their uncles and grandparents calling me horrible stuff too. So obviously they've been spreading what's happened this week and twisting it. I haven't blocked them because I want to gain as much evidence as I can for the inevitable case. Regardless of any outcome with my fiancé, I will be suing and filing a criminal case for harassment and vandalism and looking for a restraining order. I just haven't had the mental fortitude to do so yet. I'm hoping my fiancé will help me. I haven't spoken to my fiancé since the argument at the table, other than to tell him they go or I do. It was my choice to give him a couple days space to come to terms with everything and I will contact him when I'm ready. All of this, from the first message till now has been a week. It's a huge weight to contemplate leaving people you've known for 15 years and who you grew up with. He did set hard boundaries with the sister from the coffee shop as I've seen the messages. He said, paraphrasing, you have no right talking to op at all if this is how you're going to behave. She doesn't deserve this and you've gone too far. Why are you being like this? And she responded with more name calling and back and forth. He ended by saying not to message me again and to make sure everyone else does the same. I was happy with that. At this point only one person in that family had an issue, to my knowledge, so it was silly to have him cut all of them off. It may not be enough for some but it was enough for me to feel safe and comfortable. For those saying he needs therapy and counseling, he's already getting it. He's been getting it since before we even started dating after an incident at work. I don't know about any of their family though. The first time I had a conversation with any of them was that night. Some people are wondering what LW died of, and it was a botched weight loss surgery where she died of sepsis. People were wondering if he was somehow the reason behind the surgery, hence the family's insane reaction, but he was not in the slightest. He likes bigger women and wouldn't pressure something like that onto her speaking from experience. I also want to clear up the not calling the police about the car thing. 
it was entirely my idea to not file charges in exchange for a face-to-face apology and damage payment. He only wanted me to wait so that he could talk to her to see if she regretted it and then have her father pay the damages. At the time, we thought it was just the 19 yo that smashed up my car, not both daughters. Neither of us wanted to ruin her life. When I found out it was both of them, it was full steam ahead. Thank you all for your messages and hopefully I'll have a positive update for you tomorrow. Edit I chose for him to take this space apart, it's not him being indecisive. I said to take time and that I'd reach out so that his decision is thought out. It's for me. I don't want to be chosen only to be three kids down the line and stuck in a resentment-filled marriage. It's for me. Please understand that. Update. I text him saying I thought it was time to discuss this and he was back at home not a half hour later. He'd been staying with a friend the couple nights we had no contact. We sat on our bed to talk because my back is sore from all the packing and I wasn't gonna force myself to sit at the table. Before we even got to talking he asked if we could cuddle for a minute. It definitely took some of the weight off and we were able to talk like a couple and not awkward strangers because, regardless of some people's beliefs, we do love each other and it took me a very long time to feel confident in that fact. Before anyone calls me a doormat again, no, I was still sure I would stick to my ultimatum. The first thing I asked was if he felt he had enough time to make his decision and he said he didn't need time. He was very shocked and bewildered at how so much could change in just a week and how everything he knew was shook up that he couldn't think and went numb. He did apologize that he didn't take a more defensive stance at the cafe and he doesn't want to make excuses for it. An explanation was that he genuinely didn't expect such a vitriolic response. He hid the engagement because he knew they weren't over LW's death and would be upset at the news. It wasn't like I would feel upset by them not knowing, which I wasn't really. He's known these girls since before they were in double digits and he would never have thought them capable of it. It came so far out of left field that he froze. I asked him if there was any possibility that either of them had a thing for him and he looked very confused and disturbed. I said how I've had people tell me it's not uncommon for siblings to do this after loss and he thought on it. Turns out you were right. He said the 24 yo, about 8 months after LW's death made a move and tried to kiss him. He immediately left and told her mother about it, mother and father are divorced now but weren't then. She was a minor at the time and messaged him saying she would be 18 soon so it wasn't a big deal. Her mother made her see the school counselor and didn't allow her to be alone with him for a while. It was years ago so he'd forgotten it even happened. He said he was sure that wasn't the case now because it had been so long but I'm not so convinced. Not that it matters anymore. He opened up his Facebook and gave it to me to read. 24 Yo had been messaging him which he ignored. She ranged from telling him off to crying and saying how betrayed the family was to trying to manipulate him against me. He said he was sure that he needed to put them behind him, and had been thinking it on and off since he proposed, but couldn't bring himself to do it. After this week, the fire was lit and he knew what he had to do. It was all just abstract until suddenly it was very real. He asked me how I've been coping and I told him. I felt like I'd done everything right but somehow things turned out worse than if I'd been the jealous type and stopped their contact at the beginning. I tried to be understanding and put in so much effort to be secure in myself and our relationship only for everything I worked on to be thrown in my face like I was a mistress that was cheating with him. He didn't blink the entire time and just listened. He said he should have been more observant and realized I was struggling with this so that he could help me but I've always been the strong one so he neglected to and he'll do better. As I've said in a few comments now, his parents had him in their late 40s and are retired. He hates to involve them in negativity but I was stunned when he said he's been talking to them about this since the first Facebook message. They were very understanding but his father took a tough love approach. He said the best quote I think I've ever heard. Get your act together before the jig is up. They offered to come stay for a while and help us move. I don't think that's necessary but I really appreciated the thought. On the subject of moving. I made it clear that I would not be living in this house any longer than I had to and he completely agreed. His parents offered to find us a place in their state if we wanted to have more of a support network and I'm honestly considering it after all this. They're only a state away from my own family so we'd be a lot better off. His job is remote and I should be able to find work there easily enough. I've been in contact with a friend who's a mechanic and they've quoted me between 1-2k for the damages, but that's in a cost estimate as a discount. A few people have said to get a real statement and to shop around. The real cost is between 4-5k and that's just for the noticeable damage. My friend thinks they've done something to the engine so thank god I couldn't drive it anywhere. He thinks I may be entitled to a replacement car altogether. If so, I will be sure to sue for it and that's not going to be cheap. After all the emotional things were discussed he mentioned when would I be comfortable enough to go to the police. I made clear he was okay with that or go on my own. He said, the surest I've ever seen him, that this is what needed to be done and he wasn't going to let them continue. He'd done enough to try and shield them but he wasn't going to let it come at my expense. I'm currently in the bath frothing in bath bombs but will be going to the station as soon as I'm done. He's downstairs right now printing out the new quotes from the mechanics and the messages 24 yo sent him over the past couple days so we can go prepared. People have said that nothing will come of it, and you may be right but I have to try. Hoping my local police don't have anything better to do. It's a small town. To finish, I made a point of asking again if he would cut them off or I had to go. He didn't miss a beat and said that they're no longer going to be a part of his life, even if I decided to leave. 
He did ask for one last meeting to say goodbye to her parents and to put a close on that part of his life, and to explain to the girls that this is not my fault but his decision after seeing how cruel they were capable of being. After that, we would block them on everything and move forward. I was completely fine with that. So, there we have it. Writing all this out and being able to talk to people about everything has been both helpful and a good distraction from the dumpster fire that was my life and everything worked out as well as I could have hoped. We'll see how his meeting goes with them. I'm sure they won't be very happy about it, but that's not my problem. Thank you all and I'll update after they've met up. Update. So we drove down to the police station with our block of paperwork and had a couple hours talk. They were so sweet about everything. As some of you expected, they did say I should have come earlier but they didn't really care because it was only a few days. They said that it often takes people about this amount of time to actually file charges if they weren't an immediate threat or danger, so unless someone was about to throw punches. I handed them everything and it looks like I've got plenty of evidence. They'll be contacting my insurance on my behalf to get the ball rolling and so they can come to do a check of my car themselves and then they can open a claim with me if I want. They're not filing a claim, they're just notifying about the criminal damages, I've filed criminal charges for harassment and vandalism and they'll notify me with more details about my restraining order this week. My fiancé told the police that he was planning on meeting with LW's family and asked if that would contradict my case and they said no. We're not married at the time of filing so legally we're two separate entities in the case. Or something. So, my car is totaled. My mechanic friend, I'm gonna call him Tom because I can't keep saying my mechanic friend. So Tom and his partner at the shop did a full check on my car and this is the damage they found. Shattered windshield. Four slash tires. Two broken windows. Paint, obvious, I think. Unknown substance in the engine oil. Battered bodywork. They said with this amount of damage, I should just go for a new car so that's what I'll be doing. If anyone is curious, it was a Volvo. I'd always wanted one and managed to buy one new two years ago. Either they get me a new car if they'd be set back about 60k. Either way I'll be alright. The amount classifies the vandalism as a felony so they could be looking at jail time too. My fiancé met with the family on Saturday and Tom sat by the window. I currently live in a one-party state so as long as my fiancé consents, the recording can be used in my case. While it may not be as drama-filled as some of you may want, it was still pretty stressful to see. They met at the same cafe that we did before and Tom sat a few tables away. Fiancé arrived after their father and before them. For the best because they managed to have a calm conversation for once. Fiancé told him how he was feeling and Phil was very understanding but still trying to minimize. He was saying things like you know they miss LW and they'll come around and just need time to come to terms with you moving on. He kept trying to initiate paying for the damages but Fiancé wouldn't talk about it until the sisters arrived. It was like butter wouldn't melt with the 24 yo but 19 came in like the Tasmanian devil. My Fiancé didn't acknowledge anyone until it had all settled down where then he said this would be his last meeting with all of them and they'd be going their separate ways. He turned to the girls and said that he would miss who he thought they were but the way they could treat people horrified him, especially me. He said that this was all him and they needed to accept that I was not to blame. He even said that it was me who offered the apology in exchange for not filing charges. The 19 yo then interrupted asking what charges and that no one was going to charge them for barely touching a car. She was a deer in headlights when he asked what they'd done to the engine oil and the two looked at each other. Seems they didn't expect me to find that out. Cue up the groveling. 24 Yo actually tried to touch his hand and told him he had to stop me pressing charges because this would ruin her and interfere with 19 Yo's college. He said it was too late and the cops should be issuing a warrant soon, it can take a few days. I thought it was an instant thing but apparently not. This is when their dad got involved again and said for everyone to calm down and fix this like adults. Now he wants his girls to be adults. I see. He asked if fiancé would convince me to drop the charges in exchange for that apology and he'd pay the damages. When my fiancé said it was 60k, the eyes he gave to those women would shave the hair off a cat. The video wasn't the best but I swear I could see the color drain from their faces. I may sound awful but I enjoyed it. Call me what you will. They kept going on about apologizing and that they'd pay but he just said it was too late and he was done. He tried to be civil but they were the ones that wouldn't let it go. 24 yo actually asked him to set up a meeting with me so they could get to know me and put it all behind us. He didn't reply and after the silence they piped up again like so she won't even meet us? So she's behind all this because she doesn't want us around. We'll see about that. Not using exact quotes because I don't know if I'm allowed so not risking it. Things like that. They went on and on and frankly it was funny more than hurtful. But they did incriminate themselves more and more for my harassment case and the nail in the coffin was when 19 yo said if we can do that to a car, imagine what else we could do. That, my friends, is both a confession and a threat of bodily harm. My fiancé said one loud stop before wishing Phil well and telling the girls to not come near me. He then got up and left. That's where the recording ends because we wouldn't be able to use anything afterwards anyway. As for moving, we're pretty much all packed up and have a truck coming on Friday. We'll be staying with his parents until we find a place. We're looking at buying this time but might get an RV in the meantime so we're not all stepping on each other. I doubt his parents would mind at all but. This is the last update for a while I think. I have a wedding to finish, a venue to change, new invites etc and less than two months to do it. Send help.
but thank you all for being ears and helping me get through this. If only to distract me from ruminating and digging a huge mental hole. Update 3 months after first post. So it's been a while, guys. Calling the past few months a roller coaster wouldn't quite do it justice. A lot has happened and I hope I don't leave anything out. Here goes. So, first off, we've moved away. We're only a couple towns over from my husband's parents, legally but we kinda just live in their backyard and my own are the next state over. Hallelujah. It's been really great living in our new RV and we've been able to take small trips now and then too which has been great for a breather. Took a chunk out of our house savings but we're not too worried about it. Looking for a house has been fun too. I can't speak to what might have happened but by a stroke of luck, the warrants came through the day before our moving day and the sisters spent the whole move in police custody. I'm sure it was not as formal as cuffs and interview rooms but I like to imagine it that way. So we didn't have to deal with any drama that for sure would have happened otherwise. As I said before, we didn't block them because we wanted to keep the line open for more evidence and boy was that a good idea. 19 yo has only now stopped sending me messages. Started off pleading and hoping for a meet up, then went on to calling me names and such for trying to ruin her life, but the past few weeks have been pure rage which has been draining if entertaining. She says she'll find me and I'd better watch my back blah blah blah. My printer has been working overtime, as you can imagine. So many receipts to give my lawyer. 24 yo is still working on my husband but it reached ahead a few days before the wedding. We should have changed the dates but it just wasn't feasible. We had family from all over that had taken time off work and we really wanted everyone there after all that happened. She tried to call my husband over a dozen times and actually left two voicemails. She was crying and hyperventilating saying how she didn't want to lose him. For those of you who said she still had a thing for him, ding dong. My husband listened to the voicemails with me and she just rambled, it was actually quite sad. She said that she always thought they would be together because they've been through so much together and it felt right. She blamed him for leading her on and making her fall for him only to choose someone else that he hardly knew. She even said she felt replaced which made me uncomfortable. All of this all the while degrading him for betraying his LW by moving on at all. I genuinely do not understand her logic. As for my car, we found out what the unknown substance was. It was antifreeze. The entire engine was written off and, with everything else, my insurance launched a case against them for the cost of a new car. I was expecting 60k or so but Tom, my mechanic friend, said to ask for more based on current market value and such. They came back with a new offer of 75k. It took over a month for the money to hit my account but I got it. As for the case, I'm no longer going after them for the repayment, my insurance is, so that's one less thing I have to worry about. As far as I know, their father is paying for their legal fees but I doubt he'll pay back the insurance company for them. There is still a case against them for harassment and threatening behavior and I'm suing for the money it took to move away and emotional distress. My lawyer says they'll be liable and it's looking like they want to settle. I don't feel great about going for emotional distress but after everything they have done, it sure was emotionally distressing. The courts are moving slowly so I don't have anything new on the criminal case yet, other than that they are going to plead guilty. Shouldn't be long now and it's looking like they're getting probation and mandatory anger management. Not a stint in jail but oh well. At least they'll both have a record. My husband was down for a while since we left but he hasn't wavered in supporting me. He's getting back to his old self now that he's settling in at work here and he's enjoying being closer to his parents. It's been great for our relationship too because we all get on so well. As of the 21st, I'm a married woman. It was very hectic and stressful to change basically our entire wedding in two months but we did it and our guests were so understanding. We had to settle for a few things like our cake and catering, but everything else worked out amazingly. Now, we couldn't imagine it any other way. It happened as it was supposed to. All in all, things are going well and thanks everyone who got invested. It's been a tough journey. I'm just glad to have them out of my life.